Hello and welcome to season two of the Go Fermenter Winery Chat. We did a bunch of these in 20, we took a break in 21, but now that things are back to normal in 22, we're going to do at least eight episodes. Today will be episode one. So, cheers. I just got back from the Eastern Winery Exposition. I don't know if you've ever been to this show, but it's fantastic. There are great talks, there are exhibits, there's fun people to meet, you have a, they have a Ask the Experts panel, great fun. Um, we had a booth there, and I will show you what it looked like in this slide. There you can see myself standing in front of the booth. Um, we had lots of traffic, lots of old customers, lots of new prospects. In fact, the reason why I got this winery chat going again is because a lot of my old customers said, where are the winery chats? Why haven't we seen one in a long time? So I said to myself, okay, we will do one right away. And today's topic is going to be the talk that I presented at Eastern Winery Expo. And this slide shows me here in front of all these uh, colleagues, esteemed colleagues of mine, who all had presentations and talks at this conference. So anyway, Eastern Winery Exposition. Yeah, this one was in Syracuse, New York. The next one is March 23 in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Eastern Winery Expo. Sign on, join up. It's a great fun show. You will learn a lot. I expect to be there in person and you can always uh, ask me questions and um, about winemaking, whatever you want. So again, if those remember our format from past years, I sort of ramble on about new developments that we've done, experiments we've done, winemaking ideas, um, some theory, vineyards, whatever, whatever so, uh, takes my fancy. If you have any suggestions for topics, email me and we'll consider and we might do something that is what you'd like to hear about. So anyway, without further ado, let's go on to episode one. The topic is going to be reductive aromas. What's going on? So first of all, let's talk about reductive aromas. These are sulfide smells. They're caused by hydrogen sulfide. You have a stinky wine. It smells like rotten eggs. Um, really not pleasant. It's not bread or nices. This is a different smell. This is, uh, happens during fermentation. Common misconceptions about reductive aromas are that somehow closed systems are reductive. In other words, an open vat with air blowing on top of it is not reductive, but a closed fermentation in a bag is some, somehow reductive. Another misconception is that if you aerate the fermentation, you will somehow reduce these reductive aromas. As I will show you in this presentation, these are actually misconceptions. They are just uh, old wives' tales on how to deal with stinky wine. Oxygenation, by the way, is a remedial operation. It can alleviate reductive odors once they're formed, but the real objective should be not to form them to begin with, and oxygen doesn't help you in that respect. Now, the go fermenter uses closed bags, and when we first came out with this system, everyone would ask me, oh, but aren't you going to get reductive odors because you're in a closed system? And, you know, in hundreds of fermentations we've run in the last seven years, ourselves, our customers, nobody has ever reported a sulfide or reductive odor. And even though some people ask me, nobody has ever injected air into their fermentation. So what's going on? And this is the thing that's puzzled us for some years, and we did a lot of research in 20 and 21 to try to understand what's going on. It's really all to do with how the go fermenter manages the cap. Now, let's first just get everybody on the same page. What is cap management? Cap management is really a red wine phenomenon. The fermentation causes the seeds and skins in the wine to rise up. The entrained CO2 causes it to float up and it forms a cap on top. This cap must not dry out. If the upper part of the cap gets dry, you can get bacterial and fungal infections which lead to all kinds of off odors and flavors. Secondly, the cap must be constantly mixed into the liquid. All the color and most of the tannins are in the skins. And so you have to bring them in contact with the liquid. Otherwise, you won't extract any tannin or color. So cap management, small scale, 
you're familiar with this. Uh, you take a pole, you push it down, the cap comes up, you push it down, every three or four hours you go to this operation. In large scale, it's mostly pump over. So you have a tank, the top is the cap, the bottom part is a liquid, you pump liquid from the bottom and you, you pump it over the top, you kind of spray the cap, keep it wet. It kind of works, but you know, the cap doesn't really move. It's, it's wetted, but it's not broken up. So there's parts of the cap that might be dry and not really getting any liquid, other parts are more wet. Uh, there are devices that use a mechanical punt down. It's sort of like um, making a machine that pushes a pole up and down. But these are very complicated devices. They're mechanically complicated, they're expensive, and quite frankly, they're very few in use. There are rotary fermenters that move it around, again, in an effort to mix everything. Again, mechanically complicated, relatively rare. So, what are our objectives? We have to disperse the cap, we have to wet the cap, we have to mix the fermenting must. And the third point is really, really important because we need to avoid temperature gradients and we have to mix the bulk. The problem is, must is really an impossible fluid. It's like toothpaste um, or, or ketchup. It's impossible to stir. It's basically a semi-solid sludge. If you try to stir it, it will kind of mix up where your stirrer is, but away from the stirrer, it's all set. So it really is not something you can mix with a stir. The old Italians knew how to mix wine. They stomped on it. Pigage, as the French call it. The French have a word for everything in winemaking. They have, they, every single phrase has a French thing. So pigage is the act of stomping the must to disperse it. And this really works. If you squeeze a must, you actually push the cap down and you really extract colors and tannins. Now, the go fermenter really does this in a sanitary way. We don't put dirty feet in the wine. We have liners with uh, the grape fermenting in there. We have airbags that squeeze these liners. And here you see the system. You've got the wine in here. You've got the cap on top. You've got that secondary bag that squashes it. And most of you have seen our website, have seen this animation where the airbag inflates, squeezes the must, pushes the cap together, and then releases the pressure so the cap comes down and disperses, stomping, all right? But more importantly than even the punching is the fact that it mixes the bulk must. So we actually do a punch up, not a punch down. The punch down is an inherent problem with it. The cap wants to go up. So you try to push it down, it bobs back up again. Here we are actually going with the flow. The cap wants to go up, so we push it up. Then we let it go, the cap breaks up. So let's go back to our reductive aromas thing. Release of hydrogen sulfide. Reductive is a kind of a misnomer. It doesn't mean there's lack of oxygen. It really has nothing to do with aeration or closed system. It's really caused by yeast protein retooling. The yeast, if it gets into a situation where the protein that is made are no longer useful, say the temperature change or it ran out of some nutrient, it has to retool these proteins. So it breaks them back up and makes a new set of proteins. Unfortunately, most of this retooling goes through a pathway that involves an amino acid called cysteine. And during this formation, cysteine often cleaves off and throws off a sulfide molecule, H2S, and that is a cause of reductive aromas. So really, it's caused by temperature fluctuations, nitrogen deficiency, and excessively hot temperatures. So now I'm going to show you something that's going to make you wake up, a nice biochemical diagram. It looks very complicated, but bear with me. It's not so uh, difficult, and I will take you through it. This is the biochemistry how sugar over here goes to ethanol over here. So let me click on this and that's the pathway. Okay, that is the anaerobic pathway. You go from sugar and you make alcohol. The right side of the pathway is the aerobic pathway. This is, involves oxygen. It's used to make yeast. It's used to make amino acids. It means to make all kinds of building blocks in the system. And our problem is right here, H2S. So it has nothing to do with the pathway that goes to alcohol. It's got to do with the pathway dealing with amino acid synthesis, 
and destruction and reformation. This is our culprit right here. So let's go a little deeper into this section, the amino acid section, and look at another diagram. This is even more complicated. But again, don't, don't despair, right? We will get through this. So first of all, this H2S molecule in the center is really formed by nutrient limitation. So if you have a nitrogen shortage in your fermentation, you may get reductive aromas because you made sulfide due to cloggage of this pathway. And that's released out to the atmosphere. The other part is over here, which is the retooling phase, which is being recycled from cysteine. And again, leads to H2S. So again, note one thing. There's no oxygen in this whole setup. And Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the yeast that almost everybody uses, really has no use for oxygen. In fact, it is a what they call a facultative anaerobe. In other words, it can live aerobically, i.e. with oxygen, or anaerobically without oxygen. But it has a peculiar quirk. It is a rare facultative anaerobe that can live entirely without oxygen. In fact, you can grow yeast completely without any oxygen. It's not a very efficient way to grow yeast, but it's an efficient way to make alcohol. So in our winemaking, we want to make a limited amount of yeast, and we use some air in the beginning to make that population. But then we don't want air, because we don't want to encourage this amino acid pathway if we don't have to. We want to go straight sugar to alcohol, because we're making alcohol, not baker's yeast. So some of the characteristics of the fermenter, a uh, no fermenter are that, is that what is the temperature distribution, bulk mixing, and how does it handle volatile aromatics? And this will explain to you why we don't get reductive aromas. So here is some data from the wine literature. This is from a paper published in 2009. It's a 1600 liter fermentation tank. It's a stainless tank and it was it's punched down by pump over. You recall on the first slide I talked about pump over. You pump from the bottom and you spray it on top. Look, the first slide here, the cap has formed. This is our temperature profile. So this red stuff is about 30 degrees Celsius. The blue material is 17 degrees Celsius. There's about a 20 degree Fahrenheit temperature gradient between the cap and the bulk. So this is how the cap looks and it's fully formed. Now you start the pump over and you see now that the cap is dissipating. So the temperature is starting to become a little more uniform. A little later on, you see the cap is kind of dissipated and the temperature is more uniform. The red material, the 30 degree material has basically mixed in. However, a little bit later, it starts to reform. So you, you're constantly fighting the cap formation, trying to disperse it, and then it reforms all the time. Now, if you look at the go fermenter, what we did is we took uh, one of our units and we put temperature probes in the fermenter every um, uh, six, seven inches, and we measured the temperature in, in profile from the cap down to the bottom. So here's what it looks like. This is a, the legend here is the red is 30 degrees Celsius, the magenta is 22 degrees Celsius. Okay, so here is before punching. The 27 degree is actually the air space above the cap. 30, 29, this is where the cap is, it's very hot. And why is the cap hot? Because it's like an insulator. It floats up the top and it becomes like a blanket. So heat doesn't go through it, okay? Then you have the middle phases and the bottom is down at 22 degrees. So this is typically what it would look like if you fermented in a static macro bin, a tank, Anything like that. This is what's going to look like a very hot cap and then temperature gradients going downwards. Now, we start our punching process. So let's start the punch and see what happens. The cap starts to get cooler because they push down. The bottom starts to get warmer. This is the first punch. After eight hours, you can see we're down to 28 degrees at the cap and 26 degrees at the bottom. 15 hours later, seven punches. We now know the whole fermenter is starting to heat up. The fermentation is getting more vigorous, but look, it's almost uniform in profile. This is the headspace, this is the top of the, the so-called cap, and it's all uniform. It's getting more vigorous, all uniform. And this goes on all the way to the end. So in the go fermenter, there are no gradients. 
And this is why we think it doesn't get reductive aromas. The yeast never goes from a high temperature to a low temperature phase, always uniform. Never has to retool any of the proteins. The other thing we do is we have the conventional bulk down does not do any bulk mixing. I showed that to you. You punch it down, it boils back up. We also lift the bottom up on every punch cycle. So any settled material, any leaves, any yeast particles that have settled are pushed up and redispersed. We actually use punch down even in white wine making. And it, it, it really makes a very different looking white wine. It looks milky because the yeast are not allowed to settle down. They're always being churned up. This avoids any layer of dead yeast on the bottom. If you have yeast that have piled up on the bottom dead lysing, they will release odd flavor compounds and also sometimes hydrogen sulfide, depending on the level of decay in those leaves. But if you keep pushing them up, they really don't settle. And so they don't form layers that, that are basically rotting at the bottom of the fermenter. Lastly, the closed system. I already told you and demonstrated, hopefully, that the closed system does not cause sulfites. It does not cause reductive aromas, but it has many other benefits. The volatile aromatics are retained. Things are evaporating from the fermenting wine. In an open fermenter, they're just carried off into the winery atmosphere and lost. But here, they actually go up and they condense on the upper surface of the liner. You can actually see little beads of condensate, and then these beads of condensate drop back into the liquid. So we actually retain a lot of these volatile organics because the top of our bag is like a condenser. It's in contact with the cool air in the winery, and so it condenses the hot gases coming up from the fermenting material. We exclude oxygen. Now, I showed you some of the pathways. I have a colleague, his name is Professor Nick Money, he wrote a book called The Rise of Yeast, which I covered in a previous episode. Buy the book, read it. So the book basically tells you that the metabolic pathways of Saccharomyces cerevisiae are well known. Saccharomyces cerevisiae has 6,000 genes. We know all of them. There is no significant pathway in the ethanol cycle that uses oxygen. There is no evidence that oxygen reduces sulfide formation. So forget about aeration in fermentation. You might need aeration downstream in racking. If you've got something that is not being racked properly, it could cause sulfite. Now, air during racking can alleviate the problem. But in fermentation, it really does nothing. In fact, it can cause uh, bread reactions. It can cause what's called the custer effect. Not useful. Closed systems are not reductive. And last but not least, the closed system also excludes insects from the fermentation. Now, you might argue that insects add flavor, but my whole take on fermentation is you should only have what you want to have. If you want air, you put in air. It doesn't get in accidentally. You want insects, you sprinkle in some insects. They don't get in accidentally. Nothing happens by accident. Everything is deliberate, organized, reproducible, and perfectly done to what you want. You're the winemaker. It's your art. You can sprinkle in uh, deer horns or whatever you want, but nothing should happen by accident. That is our model. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed my talk. Uh, I covered a lot. Some was very complicated, but you know, you can read some of the books. There are some references on our website. Uh, Rise of Yeast is a good start. Um, email me any comments. Um, you can call me, email. Um, and again, as I said, we're open to new ideas, to new topics. Uh, we are currently uh, just about done pruning our own vineyard. You can see in the back our nice uh, pruned vines. We have uh, got uh, a new growth, which is second year new growth. We have a new white uh, varietal called Itasca. And I'm really curious how this thing turns out. This will be our first harvest with the Itasca. So again, hope to see you in the next episode. We're going to talk next episode about CO2 evolution and how to estimate ethanol in your fermentation from the evolved CO2. So cheers. Thank you again. See you next time.